Hare Krishna, Shinandan Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining today for the Monks podcast. Uh, Hare Krishna, glad to be here. Thank you, Prabhu. So, Prabhu, it's, uh, you know, I, I, my first encounter with you was through your evidences of Vedic culture's global existence. Oh, yeah, was, yeah. Where you, know, you talk extensively about uh, various uh, features of say architecture and literature and culture across the world that remarkably resemble or point to the Vedic tradition. So then since right. then, I have seen several of your books and then when I came to Detroit, I met you when you had come to Pune also, I met you once. So yeah, that's right. I remember we went, we traveled from, uh, what was it from uh, Chaupati down to Pune? Yes, that when is I, true. When I was doing that uh, lecture tour, I can't even remember. That was like 12 years ago or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a long. I think, yeah, definitely 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. I met you in Radha Gopinath Temple and then we traveled together. Yeah. So I would like to begin by asking that, say, you know, you have uh, taken a particular, you could say, a, approach to outreach that is somewhat distinctive. You know, sometimes, uh, say, as a movement, uh, we have uh, we have distanced ourselves a little bit from Hinduism and uh, and tried to portray ourselves as universal or as Krishna consciousness as uh, somewhat different from Hinduism. Whereas you focus a lot on the threats to Hinduism from say Christian conversion and other things like that. So how did you evolve this approach how, or how did you choose this approach? Uh, well, you might say it chose me because uh, basically I started writing back in 1986, 87 in a very simple way. And uh, I started, you know, producing different books that I felt were good for Westerners. I wanted to approach the Western audience, quite honestly, more than, uh, more than the Indian, Indian audience. But then I came across uh, information about how, the uh, Vedic culture disseminated around the world and you could uh, see it in different cultures like that. And I thought, you know, this is a good idea. This is a good uh, approach to show and, and build confidence in other people uh, and devotees as well about the proficiency of Vedic culture in other cultures. And uh, so anyway, I wrote that book, Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence. And oddly enough, it also became recognized by a large Indian audience. Uh, so much so that uh, I had one friend of mine, uh, a sannyasi friend, and he said, you know, one of these days uh, you're going to be called to come to India and speak on these things. And I thought, yeah, sure, right, you know. And it happened. It was like several months later that uh, I got uh, a notice some, from some friends of mine uh, and they wanted me to come to India to participate in some RSS shakas and conferences and things like that. So I, they provided my way. Uh, they, they bought the ticket and everything. And uh, so then I came to India. And the thing of it was, what happened was that they said, okay, uh, now we'll want, we want you to speak at some of these things. I thought, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that was part of the deal. And then suddenly I'm... Uh, Wait a minute. So when they invited you, they didn't tell you they wanted you to speak? Or why would they invite right. you? Because they wanted me to participate in some of the functions. So but this, what their idea the of participating, they, these were, were like conferences, lectures, things like that. And oh. uh, I've been invited uh, practically ever since then, almost every year, to go to different conferences. Uh, but this one was uh, arranged and uh, scheduled by the RSS. Oh. And, uh, and they... Uh, so how did they, uh, you come to know about your book? Was your book self-published or you got it published from some mainstream publisher or how did... Uh, well, originally when I started publishing, I formed my own publishing company. Was it the so Global I, Relief Network or something? You Yeah, the World Relief Network. That was my p personal publishing company. Okay. Uh, because I had a friend, uh, David Frawley, You've probably heard of him. Yeah, of course, yeah. He told me that, you know, uh, it's hard to find a publisher that's interested in publishing philosophy, which is very true. Uh, so you almost have to do it yourself. But then as this book came out, more and more people 
kind of grasped it and took an interest in it. And so that's how some of the members of the RSS found out about it. In fact, they ordered a case of my books, about 30 books. And they were having a conference, I think it was in May of, 19, of, of 2000, I think it was. And they distributed copies of that book to all the prominent people that were at that conference. And then from there, they asked me to come, I think it was in June or something like that, a few months later, and uh, to participate in some of their uh, meetings. And then when I got there, they said, that's when they said, uh, we'd like to have you speak at some of these things too. And so I didn't know it, but they arranged a two week tour through different towns and villages. Well, I should say different towns and cities hmm. uh, with uh, Professor Subash Kak. So we traveled together by train, bus, everything. We were together for two weeks. And I was speaking every night. And uh, so, you know, I, I had never spoken in front of an Indian audience before. So I wasn't exactly sure how to approach it. But uh, by the time I got to Vijayawada, uh, I remember I was, I was speaking so forcefully that when after the conference, somebody came up to me and you could always tell how your reaction, how effective your speech was by the reactions of the audience afterwards. Mm -hmm. And this man came up and he says, you know, when you were speaking, I thought you were like the return of Vivekananda. Of course, we're not trying to be Vivekananda, but the point of it was to them, that's a very high compliment. Of course. Yeah. And uh, so then I realized, wow, something is really happening here. And so Subhash Kak would give a, a lecture on more of the scientific aspects of Vedic culture. And I would give a talk basically from the heart about how influential Vedic culture was to me and other people that I knew about. And so that was very uh, convincing to them and they liked it. And, uh, right. and as I became more used to speaking to the Indian audience, I became more bold about it. And, and, uh, and they, had, they were attracted to that, how a Westerner, feels about their culture. They were very interested in that. Because one thing I was told too, is that Bajpayee, when he was the prime minister at the time, he said, you know, you Westerners can say what we cannot. And I didn't know what that meant. What does that mean? What we Westerners can talk about the Vedic culture in a way that the Indians cannot. And then I realized, yeah, a lot of times, swamis that speak in front of an audience they're expected to say certain things you know they they you know what they're going to talk about or what they're going to uh, con try to convince you of but for a westerner to come it was a totally different thing why would a westerner who's grown up in an affluent materialistic culture come to india and talk about how grand and how great and how influential the vedic culture is so that's what uh, i understood where now I can see, I could see where I could say things and Westerners can say things that sometimes, I mean, if it's done appropriately and diplomatically, we can say things that the uh, other people cannot say and be more convincing about it because we have no agenda, so to speak. And uh, so that caught on quite a bit. So I went through that whole uh, tour and then uh, we just several months later, they asked me to come back. Yeah, this, just a minute. Sorry, just a little backtrack. So you said you wrote the book in 1986, and then well, I, I first started writing books in 1986. The, so first, I wrote okay. The first book was the Secret Teachings of the Vedas. Oh, okay. <clears throat> then after that came uh, the Universal Path to Enlightenment, and then after that came the uh, Vedic Prophecies. Uh, after that came the uh, How the Universe Was Created and Our Purpose in It. And so it kind of developed after that. And then there was a few more books. And then in 1998, I think it was, that's when I wrote uh, Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence. Oh. And that's basically what opened the doors. I mean, that book, the thing of it was when I wrote that book, I didn't think too many people would be interested. I thought it was a topic that should be told. But I didn't think too many people would be interested in reading about it. Sure. Mm. So I wrote it in kind of a very informal way. I didn't use, I used a lot of references, but I used, I put a lot of the references in the back of the book, whereas opposed, I didn't use a lot of footnotes and things like that. Yes. Biggest mistake I ever made. 
because I didn't realize that this became one of my best-selling books, and it's still a very a good seller today. Yeah. Even though afterwards, 10, 15 years after that, I started putting together another book called The Mysteries of the Ancient Vedic Empire. And in that book, I used completely different information, completely different references, and I used a lot of footnotes and you know, uh, quotes from different uh, sources to show exactly where all this information was coming from. Okay. So that was done much more academically, I might say. Okay. And uh, yes, so that's how I got started, basically. Okay. So then all this time from 1986 to 1998, there was no practically, I don't think there was Amazon or eBooks. So how did you publicize the books? Because self-publishing now is much easier than it was at that time. So well, what I did at first was I, uh, I formed it as part of a home study course. So I had a book, I had tapes, I had uh, the transcriptions of the tapes, I had other notes, and then a test that you take, and then you get a certificate. And I, I would advertise in magazines. Of course, back then, there was much fewer magazines to choose from than there are today. And uh, so I would sell a few copies of the course, but I found where most of the people, uh, they were just interested in the book. So I thought, okay, well, that's good enough. That's fine with me. Uh, but then what happened was, uh, later on, there was a company called Baker and Taylor. And they started ordering copies of the books. And now Baker and Taylor is a major book distributing company. And they sell to a lot of uh, bookstores, university bookstores, things like that. Now, when they started ordering the book, then I thought, okay, okay, I got to take this a little more seriously. And so then in uh, 1987, I went to India and I completely redid the book. I did, took half of it and put it into one book with a travel section with a bunch of pictures of India. And then I took the other half of the book and came out with the Universal Path to Enlightenment. And it was about that time where I got an order from a company I'd never heard of before called Amazon. And they were wondering, okay, well, what's the uh, discounted price? Can we order it? You know, sure, no problem with that. And I was thinking, what is Amazon anyway? You know, and I had no idea what it was. And uh, so, but later, you know, as it developed, you know, I realized what Amazon was. Amazon became much a bigger company. And, and now I sell most of my books through Amazon. Yeah. So it it uh, it kind of let me know that you know this is this is I should need to take this more seriously than I was. So that's how that whole thing developed. And then when I came to Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence, that's when that was about the time Amazon started uh, getting into the uh, publishing business, not just the book selling business, but also the publishing business in about nineteen or no, 2005 or something like that. Mm. And so, and then, uh, well, maybe a few years earlier, and then a few years later, they came out with the Kindle, which was like a completely new market area. So then I started reorienting my books to also sell not only in paperback, but also through Kindle, which practically doubled uh, the, the book sales that I was doing. And so then, you know, you have to keep up with the technology and all this stuff. And uh, now I sell more Kindle editions of my books than uh, paperbacks. Uh, so it's been a gradual evolving process, which kind of developed into a, a cottage industry for myself, you might say. Uh, so anyway, it's been a very interesting process. But the, one of the reasons why I started writing books was because I felt like I was never a very good speaker. I wasn't very good at giving lectures. At least that's the way I felt. And uh, of course, at this time, I've given hundreds and hundreds of lectures to many different places and venues. But so I wanted to come out with the uh, philosophy in a way where I could get around that problem. And so instead of, you know, be, being a speaker, I became a writer. And like I said, I was writing mostly with the intention of reaching a Western audience, which means you have to take this high level philosophy and simplify it. So mm -hmm. people can understand it. Don't use too many big words. Don't use too much Sanskrit, things like this, so that people can, you know, absorb themselves into it 
without getting frustrated or bored or distracted. And then they put the book down because then you don't know when they're going to pick the book up again, uh, especially with uh, Westerners like that. So anyway, that's what, how I got started. But so to answer your question, how I got started with preaching to the Indian audience is that after this tour in 2000 with Professor Subhash Kak, I started seeing various needs of how the Indian audience needs to take more pride in their culture, become more protective of their culture. And so I started to change the purpose of my writing for an Indian audience uh, instead of just a Western audience, because they, I didn't realize it, but they also liked the way I was writing and they, they felt, uh, you know, some connection with it. They felt some pride in it. And uh, so that's how my audience became, instead of, or the book writing became geared from a Western audience to a more Indian audience. Now it's pretty much half and half generalized like that. Oh. Uh, but that's how I got started with uh, becoming invited almost every year to come to India, either for a lecture tour or to participate in conferences and things like that. Uh, so it's been quite a yeah. door opening uh, means of uh, uh, preaching work like that. Yes. <clears throat> so for when you came to India in 2000 and you said you, you spoke from the heart about how Vedic culture has benefited you and others. So was that the time when you started speaking more broadly about Vedic culture and not specifically about Krishna consciousness? Because say when you're yeah. addressing the RSS, what kind of topics would you speak to them? Because sometimes, some, because sometimes I'm well, I would always, yeah, I would always present myself as being a devotee, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, and they all respected that because, quite honestly, many people feel and view ISKCON as a prime agency, if I can call it that, for preserving and protecting Vedic culture. We, of course, we we preach Krishna consciousness, but they also see that as part of Vedic culture, which it is. There's no Harmon saying that. And uh, so because of that, I could give a more well-rounded view and dissertation on what Vedic culture has done for me. What, you know, because obviously I was looking for a higher level of spiritual life anyway at the time when I was a teenager, and uh, which led me to Bhagavad Gita, which finally led me to joining the ashram and uh, developing myself like that. So I would talk about how, what Vedic culture has done for me, what it's done for friends, what it's done for Western culture, how many people have been attracted to it, uh, and like that, how, how it's given me the understanding of who and what is God, what is the soul, what is reincarnation and karma, all these different things which it holds the roots of. The Vedic culture holds the roots of these things. I mean, you can always find, you know, uh, information about this in New Age books. But the fact of the matter is, the roots of all this information come from the Vedic tradition itself. Mm -hmm. And when I would speak about these kind of things and what it's done and how it's uh, given people the means for being happy and understanding and a purpose in life and the means to reach their highest potential, they would become fascinated because here's some Westerner that, and, and nobody has really spoken about this kind of thing before reaching their highest potential. Because I'll tell you, right now, even in India, you can see this, where the Western youth, has or the Indian youth have become very Westernized. Yes. In the sense that they ask, they don't just take to Vedic culture or Hinduism because their grandmother did it or their parents told them to do it. Now it's like it's the mantra, what's mm. in it for me? Which That's is a typical Western approach. Nobody's in the West, nobody's going to take to something unless they can understand how it's going to improve their life and what they're going to get out of it. And the Indian youth are the same way. They ask themselves the same question. So you have to approach it and give them that means of understanding how Vedic culture can do something for them, how it can be applied to their life, how can it become more, how their life can become more fulfilling by utilizing it, and how they can reach their highest potential by utilizing the different avenues of spiritual development and also the other avenues like uh, Vastu Shastra, Ayurveda, Jyotish, all these different things that the Vedic culture is known to have in their own lives to improve themselves, whether it's be improve their health, improve their emotional status or state, 
improve their intellectuality, uh, and ultimately improve their spiritual progress. Yes. All these different things can be attained through the Vedic system because that's what it's for, to raise everybody up to higher and higher levels of reaching their potential. And uh, so when I would approach this kind of thing, yeah. people would become fascinated by it. Mm. So Prabhu, when you talk about, say, this what is a pragmatic spirituality, or uh, which is what attracts people now, not many people are interested in philosophical spirituality per se. That, as you said, what's in it for me? So now, in terms of pragmatic spirituality, Say we can as a movement, we as a scon maybe can talk about how you may have some bad habits and you can give those up and you can easily become free from those. So when you talk about reaching your potential, what exactly did you mean by that? Is it that see there is a genre of <coughs> self-help spirituality and um, where you talk about motivation and achievement. And I noticed that Christians have used self-help spirituality a lot. In fact, before being in, in, introduced to Krishna consciousness, I used to read a lot of self-help books. And I saw many Christian authors. I think there was Norman Vincent Peale who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking and books like that. So when you are talking about right, attaining your potential, I have not seen you writing too much in the self-help genre. So there are, I think, some books which go in that genre. But your genre is... Not exactly that. So when you talk about reaching your potential, so one could be like a self-help genre, the other could be more like a behavioral genre where you say you have bad habits and things like that. But what, what do you mean exactly by reaching your potential? Well, it's like I've uh, come out with a few books called, uh, one called Vedic Culture, The Difference It Can Make in Your Life. And that was back when I was the president of the Vedic Friends Association. And I collected our articles from the likes of, uh, you know, Michael Cremo, Subhash Kak, Jeffrey Armstrong, uh, Pratichi Mathura, who's an Ayurvedic practitioner, uh, Chakrapani Ulal, who's a Vedic astrologer, Howard Beckman, who's a Vedic gemologist, you know. And so basically what I did was I collected all these articles to show and put it into a book called Vedic Culture, The Difference It Can Make in Your Life, to show the different avenues that the Vedic tradition offers that you can can use in your life to bring yourself up to a higher level of understanding who and what you are, how you got here, but also how to use Jyotish, for example, to improve your life, how to use Ayurveda to improve your health, how you can use the different aspects of, uh, you know, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Astanga Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Mantra Yoga, all these different things to increase your spiritual development. So uh, it depends on what book you look at of mine that you could say it was either self-help or not self-help. You know, I've, uh, I don't approach it as self-help. I approach it as the, what the Vedic tradition can do for you. I always approach it through the purpose of uh, promoting the Vedic tradition, not that just, oh, there's a self-help book, you know. Yeah, there's hundreds of those out there. So I don't, I don't want to be like another one of those. Uh, but, you know, and it's... Uh, Interestingly enough, I've got some good reviews on that book. In fact, I'm just redoing that book now uh, to come out with a, uh, uh, another version of it, which will be uh, published through Amazon at a less expensive price, more availability like that. So, uh, but in my own example, uh, before I joined the ashram, back in, when I was just in my early 20s, uh, I used to be a musician. And as a musician, sometimes you get together with other musicians and you would, you know, smoke a few cigarettes or this or that. And, but in the meantime, I was always going to the temple. And this was when I was living in Boston. I was always going to the temple. And so that's when I started chanting at least two rounds every day. I would spend, and then four rounds every day. So I'd spend an hour every day, one half hour reading Bhagavad Gita, which soon developed into an hour of reading every day and even more than that and then a half an hour at least chanting. But together, with those two things together, that really started to purify or spiritualize my consciousness. And I could feel an inner power within me. And the first thing I said, well, I can feel this inner power, this inner strength. What am I gonna do with it? Which oh, year okay. was this? Uh, this must have been about 72, 
273. And uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to quit smoking. And I did. I just kept chanting, and it gave me a higher taste, and I just gave up smoking altogether. So even if I was with other musicians jamming and things like that, I didn't have a taste for it. And so gradually, by engaging in Krishna consciousness, it's not that you have to give up bad habits. It's just that you rise to a higher level of uh, perceiving yourself, perceiving who and what you are, so that you naturally give up some of these bad habits. It just, it, you just, it's a natural organic change that takes place rather than forcing yourself to, you know, I got to, you know, change my ways or I got to change my habits. It just becomes automatic. Who needs it? Who needs to smoke a cigarette? I just, the idea was that whenever I had a taste for a cigarette, I would think to myself, well, you just had a cigarette. It might have been days since I had one. I just had a cigarette. What's good is another cigarette going to do? And it just became like, yeah, what the heck? Chan Hare Krishna and, and rise above the whole uh, attraction of that. And I just gave it up completely. And so the point of it is, if I can do it, anybody can do it. This is indeed the potency and the power of Krishna consciousness and the Hare Krishna mantra. Anybody can use it. So I would uh, talk about this, you know, include at least this kind of aspect in my own preaching work. And it became very effective. People became attracted to that. So you would mention specifically about chanting Hare Krishna or you talk generically about yoga and meditation and mantra chanting and worship of the Vedic deities? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically I would start very generically. When I give a talk to an Indian, Indian audience, I would talk very generically. But then sometimes, especially when I was, especially when I was on that uh, tour with the Chalpati devotees, I would go into uh, uh, different universities and they would say that they couldn't come into the university where I could because I didn't have a shaved head. Hmm. Where if they came in, they would, you know, the university would frown on it or tell them to leave. And uh, I remember in one place, uh, where was it? Somewhere in, uh, well, I think it was Mumbai, but we went to an IIT camp, uh, campus. And I went in and the devotees had to stay in the car because they couldn't be seen because the campus, the mm -hmm. co college had become upset because they had been making too many devotees that were leaving the college. So they mm -hmm. didn't like that. So I would go in there and I would speak. I would speak very generically and then come up and become more specifically. But in the questions and answers, they would specifically ask about me. What was my spiritual practice? What did I do? And I would be very specific. I chant Hare Krishna. I am a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. I, you know, been reading Bhagavad Gita for years. You know, you should do the same thing. And so once they started asking, asking questions, hey, there is no more generics involved. There is no more holds barred, so to speak. I would just come out and be straight with them. And of course, then, you know, what's the college going to do at that point? They can't do anything. They're asking me a question. I'm giving an answer, a personal answer. So uh, that's how I approached it, <laughs> and it, okay. it worked very well. And then, then we would go and uh, meet at somebody's uh, college uh, dormitory room, or not dormitory, but college uh, room in, in one of the uh, hostels. Yeah, hostels like that. And, uh, and then many people would show up. All these people would show up. It was supposed to be, it was, I think it was just off campus, so they could still get away with it. But many people would show up, and then I would continue giving a class, giving, answering questions and things like that. And that's one of the greatest things I found is that, you know, these uh, uh, camps, as they call them, in Mumbai, especially by the uh, Chalpati devotees, they would have all these camps at these college uh, and universities where they would have people living together, and they would uh, go to college, but come back, have a morning program, an evening program. And they would have a couple, maybe a couple uh, people there that would cook for them and stuff. It was very effective in giving the means by which people could become Krishna conscious while they're still going to college and preparing for their future. It's a very good way to make devotees because I'll tell you right now, I'm getting a lot of reports from places like Delhi, Mumbai, where people... I just got a report yesterday where a girl 
who was a nice Hindu girl, vegetarian. She goes to college. What happens? She comes out being anti-Hindu, eating beef, giving up all her Hindu practices, and also criticizing her parents for observing whatever traditions they still observe from the Vedic tradition. So it's these colleges which are actually, and the influence and the atmosphere there, which are actually taking people away from the tradition of Vedic culture and the Indian customs that they're grown up with. And so, you know, this is becoming a very difficult thing and a very sad thing when I get so many reports through my contacts with social media where many people and the youth especially are giving up their Vedic traditions and the customs and the Hindu practices that they've had. Uh, so it's a very sad thing. But, you know, these camps that they had at these colleges in uh, the universities in Mumbai was a very effective way to bring people in and teaching them how to maintain their culture, maintain their practice in a practical way where they can still prepare for the future and uh, have a marketing skill of some kind. So this is very effective. And I really appreciated that. So yeah. that was, I really liked being a part of that uh, tour where I could see many of these kind of things going on. Yes, bro. In fact, we, we call them as bases or youth centers, basically. And I was also introduced to such a youth center itself. When I was in a college, we converted. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, we converted the room where I was staying into such a youth center. <laughs> Used to have programs at my room. And then my room partner, I, we all started practicing seriously, started sharing also eventually. Yeah, that's true. So Yeah, and look what happened to you. <laughs> now it's Krishna's mercy came through that. So yeah. now, now here, there is, uh, there is something which I observed initially. And then uh, that is a question which comes up to me also at various times. That say we as a movement uh, often, sometimes do interfaith programs with other religious groups. Now we have a Christian Vaishnav dialogue and then we also have a Muslim Vaishnav dialogue happening. So we seem to be much more sim sympathetic or ready to dialogue with, uh, with non-Vedic traditions. If I may use the word non-Vedic in a specific sense, sure. inclusive sense, we could say everything, uh, we, there's a different terminology, but say with other groups within the Vedic tradition, sometimes... Uh, we seem to criticize them quite strongly and um, we have a somewhat by we I'm talking of the movement uh, mm. it's gone as a movement we seem to have a somewhat tense relationship with them and some some of the prominent leaders of modern day the modern day Hinduism sometimes we are quite critical of them and uh, so this is, uh, so this is, I think, where you chose a distinct approach. So why do you think it, we have evolved in such a way that, you know, we can, we can dialogue with and appreciate non-Vedic groups, but we keep a distance from or even criticize other Vedic groups? Well, I think one thing is, uh, I well, one thing is Prabhupada was always very uh, cautious, if I can say it that way, about associating with impersonalists. Hmm. And I, I totally agree with that because impersonalism itself cuts off your relationship with Krishna. Hmm. Simple as that. But at the same time, we can agree on so many other things. We can agree on the basics of the philosophy. We can agree on the need to preserve and protect the tradition and know how to promote the tradition so that we can perpetuate it. That's what I call the four P's or four PERS for me is protect, promote, preserve, to perpetuate the tradition. Because in this day and age, I can tell you right now, many Hindus are not into the idea of promoting their culture. But like you know, as well as anybody, you might have the best book available on a particular topic, but if nobody knows about it, nobody's going to buy it. So the same thing goes. We may have the best tradition and the best culture available, but if nobody knows about it, if nobody knows how pro profound it is, how deep it is, nobody's going to take it seriously. So on the basic level, we can all get along with uh, Shaivites, uh, Brahmanandis, uh, Shaktas, uh, you know, all these people 
and all these different sects within the Vedic culture, because it's all part of the Vedic tradition. The Vedic tradition itself, and many people don't see this, was always to meant to take you from wherever you are and bring you up to a higher level of understanding, a higher level of development, no matter who and what you are, what your background is. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing. And we have to understand, we may be so sympathetic to trying to get along with Christians and Muslims, but do they feel the same respect towards us? Not always. We can find that basically they respect us as long as they can try to con have a position of convincing us that we should become one of them. But at the same time, when it comes to preserving and protecting the Vedic culture, why can't we work with other traditions, other sects within the Vedic tradition to help protect ourselves? Because I can tell you right now, if one aspect of Vedic culture is under threat, under attack, we all are. Maybe we as Vaishnavs or devotees are not getting attacked right now, but don't think we're not on their table. Don't think we're not on the plans of what they can do to get our property, to get our temples, or to make sure that somehow or another um, they can have some control over us. Because I can tell you right now, it was like uh, 10 years ago, I was invited to participate in a conference at Tirupati when there was a Swami, Kamal Kumar Swami, non iskan probably an impersonalist, but he went for six months on a padiatra from village to village to village. And by doing that, I joined him on the last few days of that. And we, we went from village to village. We sat down and ate with uh, other Hindus, uh, other people that were in the village. And we, he brought, by that process, he brought 10,000 people to Tirupati in a rally to convince the government to hand over the control of 30,000 Hindu temples. Many people haven't even heard of this. But there's a state law on almost every state in India, which allows the state to figure that if they can judge that a temple is not being appropriately managed, they can put in their own people into the board of directors of that temple and begin to take it over and adjust the uh, management of it. And those people that they put in there can be Christians, Muslims, or whoever. People that don't even give a damn about the condition of the temple or the upkeep or the maintenance or anything like that. And so we established, we had a big rally where 10,000 people paraded through the streets of Tirupati. And because of that, the, the, the state government gave back or agreed to give back 30,000 temples that they were in control of. Uh, but they kept 2,000 of the most profitable temples. In other words, those temples that were making the most money and bringing in the most money to the state, they still kept 2,000 of those. So the whole idea was that, sure, we got back 30,000 of those temples, and that was in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And what happened was that uh, Kamal Kumar Swami was going to go on another six-month Padiatra, and they were going to have another get-together a year after this, and to once again try to convince the state government to give back the remaining 2,000 temples. So these are problems, these are issues that are going on in India that unfortunately many people don't know about. So this is one of the doors that opened up for me to help in this way, simply because I became more receptive or more open to working with people from whatever lineage they came from. It doesn't mean I watered down my philosophy. It doesn't mean I watered down my uh, Krishna consciousness or anything like that. But it showed that we could work together on the basic level of preserving and protecting uh, the Vedic tradition. And uh, one thing that, uh, that did happen was that a uh, very prominent sannyasi, Swami, uh, Swami Dhananda Saraswati, who was from Coimbatore, uh, he liked what I did, and uh, because of that, he helped, he helped support me for five years. Five years, he had his organization send me a check which helped pay my rent, because I was living in an ISKCON house, but I still had to pay rent to the temple. And so he supported me in that way, and I, I, you know, I, I'll never forget him for helping me out like that, but he was the one that started what was called the Acharya Sabha. And this Acharya Sabha, included 200, 200 of the most prominent uh, acharyas and spiritual leaders in, in India. 
The only re uh, requirement was that your institution had to be at least 200 years old. And so they, and they were from all sects, you know, Vaishnav, uh, Shaivites, Tantric, it didn't matter. They all came together and spoke and dealt with issues that they were all dealing with to provide the protection and the promotion of the Vedic tradition in India. And I remember one friend of mine, uh, Parnavati Swami, he went to one of these Acharya Sabhas, but they wouldn't let him in. And uh, he called me up later on. He said, I want to thank you. I said, thank me for what? Because I wanted to go to this Acharya Sabha, but they wouldn't let me in. And so then they, I said, but I know Stephen Knapp. And they said, oh, okay. They let him in. And uh, for that reason, he wasn't allowed to participate, but he could be there and watch how everything proceeded. And uh, so I think it's one of those things that is, is very commendable in the sense of bringing in so many different people to work on the issues that affect all of us. Doesn't mean we try to convince one person or the other that I'm right, you're wrong, you need to change your sect or lineage or whatever. We don't do any of that stuff. There's mutual respect. 200, they built a, a platform where 200 uh, Vyasasan sat on a platform for all 200 of these acharyas, and they would all give uh, talks and discussions about what to do about particular issues, especially when dealing with the government control of Hindu temples and things like that. So the point of it is, the government can't be trusted, quite honestly, even the Indian government. And uh, I'm not talking about Modi in particular, I'm talking about state governments because some of these state governments are indeed um, headed up by, say, uh, people of other religions and people who really don't care about the longevity of uh, Vedic culture. They want to know how they can utilize the properties, the assets of the temples for their own purposes. Yeah. And this is one of the things why they like to take over the temples. The temples may begin to crumble from lack of maintenance, but oh, while they had this 30-acre section of land, we can sell that, use that money for our state uh, purposes or from the personal purposes of the government leaders and things like that. That's what's been going on. And uh, that's just one of the aspects of, uh, that I wish uh, devotees would also see as a uh, thing that could affect them also, just like Mayapur. Well, you know wouldn't the state love to get their hands on that property, especially the more it's developed? Well, we can make sure that that doesn't happen, but it doesn't mean it's not on their drawing board, so to speak. So, uh, yes. I mean, we have a lot of work to do. Yes. I mean, just like you probably know that there is a group of comedians in India which are very anti-Hindu. Of course, comedians always have to have something to laugh at, something to make fun of. But some of them are directly and purposely uh, criticizing Hinduism and Vedic culture. So, and there was, you probably heard that there was one movie in uh, Tamil Nadu, which was very derogatory towards Krishna. <clears throat> of course, that's another state where uh, the different religions are coming very prominent. I mean, I could be very specific about this if you wanted me to, but I won't go that direction too much in this talk. But um, so one uh, writer for the Hindustani Times, who was a young girl, came out and talked very negatively about Krishna and said, yes, I know mythology and this and that. That's Fortunately, the Hindus, who have a bad habit of simply staying asleep when these matters come up, they got together and they forcefully uh, made her apologize for what she said and she also lost her job. Yeah. Now, this sets an example that people need to have a little more respect for what they say and what they do regarding their uh, uh, attitude and their comments about uh, Vedic culture. Uh, because uh, even in Kerala, the Hindu prominence, the Hindu population has decreased to such a degree that they're no longer a majority. That's from what I've heard anyway, from Kerala. It's mostly Marxists, communists, uh, Muslims, and Christians now. So what this means, is this, a, is this a bad thing? Well, it's certainly not a good thing, because when 
uh, students, for example, object to, say, a professor's view on Hinduism. You know, he's a Hindu, he promotes it, and when the students object to that, he can lose his job or even getting beat up or stoned in the streets. Is anybody going to do anything about it? No, because he's, in a, he's become a minority. So this is also something that we have to be careful of. We have to make sure that Vedic culture remains a dynamic and thriving uh, culture within India mm -hmm. and keep it as the homeland of Vedic culture so that we can all participate in whatever way we need to. Uh, and so that Krishna consciousness can come to the fore of preserving and protecting, promoting and perpetuating the Vedic tradition. And so that means we should, the point is, we should never take too much, too much pleasure in winning a battle if it's not clear that we're, not, we're winning the war. There's a war that's going on. The war of Kurukshetra, as you might say, is still going on. We have to make sure that, okay, we've uh, won a battle. We've, got, we've distributed so many books. So many people are coming to the temple. We've got a brand new temple in this city or that city, which is great. It shows the power that ISKCON has as it's coming through Prabhupada from Lord Krishna and Lord Chaitanya. But we should not take too much pride in that, thinking that we have won the war, because the war is still going on. As I've been explaining, all these issues, all these challenges, which are still happening within India, we have to make sure that we can also understand it and how to tackle these issues. One thing, for example, I'll tell you, I did one two minute, tours of the Northeast of India. One minute, one minute. No, because I would like to reflect on some of the issues you mentioned before you move forward. So I appreciate this metaphor of battle and war, what you said lastly, that there is a particular, particular cultural setting that allows us to easily or at least without too much difficulty share Krishna consciousness, share Krishna Bhakti and we take it for granted but that itself is under threat, is being challenged. So mm -hmm. now with respect to some questions about this, uh, we, with respect to this Hindu temple that was in your books that I read it for the first time and then I did some further research. Can you hear me Prabhu? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just listening. <laughs> yeah, then I did further research and saw that that, that is quite an alarming fact. So how did this actually happen that the government can take over Hindu temples? It can't do that to mosques and churches. So is this a flaw in the constitution or is there a legal loophole? Because it seems uh, scandalous at one level that they could just take over temples. And the way you put it in one of your books is quite graphic that that they may take, they may take the the dakshina that uh, worsh, Hindu worshipper may have given to a temple, and that may might be used actually to to build a structure for some other religion or fund something like that. So, what what is the legal? How is this happening actually? Well, it's a state law. It's not doesn't have <clears throat> the constitution, but each state can pass its own laws uh, to be able to do this. So, so you have to take it by a state-by-state state, uh, 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 view of it. So basically, the, if the state can prove that the temple is not being managed properly, then they will take over the management. Is it like that? Right. And then what is the basis for saying that it is not being managed properly? They do some investigation to see if funds are not being... Uh, manage or what does not being properly managed mean? Uh, it could be anything. It could be anything that they want. You know, if a state uh, uh, chief minister or something like that has a, uh, um, an allegation against a particular temple, then he can say, well, they're not treating certain people fairly. They're, they're not managing properly. They're not managing the funds properly or whatever. So they do a s certain investigation. And whether the temple is actually uh, guilty of that or not, they can be accused of that so that the state can come in and say, well, we're going to change the management of the temple and we're going to put in some of our own people to watch over how things are happening. And uh, then they can put in whoever they want. And once they do that, they can decide for themselves in whatever, they way, whatever, they, uh, whatever way they want to uh, do as they wish. So this That's is, the way it works. So this is uh, 
in which all states? Is it in most of the states or is it more, more southern? In, yeah. Well, when I was first starting to do the research, I found that it was, I thought it was just in a few states, but actually it's most states that have this as a law that they can fall back on. It's not that every state uses that law, okay. but many states can if they want. And many states like Andhra Pradesh and others, they are deliberately using this law to the max, or at least they were, until okay. uh, you know, people started to really object. But so the objection means to be, it has to be organized, it has to be coordinated, so that it means, like we had 10,000 people come to Tirupati to uh, object to this thing. It has to be impressive enough that where the state government begins to think, okay, okay, we got to relent to their demands. Uh, without that, a few people can't do anything. I mean, you might have a few lawyers, like uh, uh, Subramanya Swami or somebody like that, that can come in and get into uh, uh, the legalities of something and bring it to court. But unless you have some, uh, you know, a emphasis and power behind you, uh, they're just, they're just going to laugh in your face. So, Bro, in principle, they could do this even for churches and mosques. But they yeah, don't. Well, remember that, well, they don't do that because that is considered a minority. So okay. they won't do that for a minority. But remember, Prabhupada specifically uh, established ISKCON as not necessarily a religious organization or even as a temple. He established it as an educational institution. So that the state regard has a completely different view of an educational institution. This is the difference. However, that doesn't mean that it has not, that certain states have not already taken over particular educational institutions. They can still do that if they want, but it's a little different. So, uh, so Prabhupada was very intelligent in that way, but you have to learn how to strategize and all this stuff so you can avoid uh, being easily manipulated by certain institutions and uh, uh, government. So for example, now, <coughs> say in Andhra or South, South India, so are the prominent temples with Hindus Say, for example, Tirupati, there's a, there's a Tirupati Trust. So is that uh, run by Hindus or is it independently run by that temple's tradition or is it run by the government? How is it? Uh, well, the government has tried to make some influence in there specifically. And, and, uh, but it is still run by the TTD, the Tirupati Temple uh, Trust. And, uh, so that is uh, an independent body? It's, it's made of Hindus or it is... It is yeah, like, okay. it's made of Hindus, but even though the government has tried to infiltrate it mm. uh, in different ways, but what they're really doing is they're starting to allow churches and mosques to come into Tirupati and buy up portions of land to establish mosques and maybe Christian institutions nearby, which then has more and, and increasing influence in the area. So this is what's another thing that's happening. And uh, many Hindus may object to that, but like I said, if they're not, if the objection isn't organized, if it doesn't have enough power behind it, uh, it has no effect, quite honestly. And yes. so this is another challenge, even just to Tirupati, which is a long standing, you know, very wealthy, very prominent temple. Uh, it's still under, uh, threat, you might say, to different degrees. Hmm. So are there any prominent temples that have been taken over by the government or most of the prominent traditional temples are still with Hindus? So for example, South India has a lot of uh, sacred places. I can't say for all states, but I know in Andhra Pradesh, uh, you know, and some of these temples may be very small, some of them may be more established. Uh, but like I said, they had over 30,000 temples which were under government control. So which that year is were you talking amazing. about? So that agitation you mentioned, which year was that? Where there was a walk across um, several years ago? Yeah, it was maybe about 10 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more than that. Okay. So and that, that was very effective. That was very effective. Yeah, now another point you mentioned about, say, uh, comedians satir satirizing or, you know, deriding, mocking, uh, uh, Mocking personality sacred in our tradition. So, 
there are two distinct aspects to this one is that we do want to ensure that there is no uh, no blast no unfair criticism or as i said mocking of sacred personalities at the same time there is there is the provision of freedom of speech so now sometimes in the media a, some people say that you know we are not like uh, the intolerant abrahamic religions so <clears throat> we don't uh, now some people compare and they say that you know, nobody would criticize the sacred personalities of other religions because they don't because they will take action which is true but then at another level when when there is a opposition done like this often the media portrays as you know we are being intolerant that there is threat to the freedom of speech so where do we draw a line say that we don't want to first of all be intolerant or appear intolerant but at the same time there is a limit for freedom of speech so so how do we ensure that there is also a issue of public relations or optics that if we come off as intolerant that also becomes a problem so any thoughts on this what, why are you worried about looking intolerant you're already viewed as intolerant are you kidding you're already viewed as communal you're already viewed as sat, trying to saffronize India. You're already viewed like that, like that. So the point of it is, is that at least we should have the gumption that when somebody unnecessarily criticizes Hanuman, for example, or Lord Shiva, or any of that, that we stand up and say, no, this is hurtful. You're going too far with this. It's time to stand down. Make your jokes about something else. Sure, you can talk about, uh, you know, different characteristics or habits of Hindus or Indians in general, but when you deliberately talk about uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, or try to mischaracterize different deities, different images, or Krishna, or whatever, in uh, the uh, arena of public opinion, then that's going too far. The problem is you have uh, the media itself, whether it's The Wire, whether it's the Hindustan Times, whether it's so many of these newspapers are anti-Hindu to begin with. So whenever something happens, if it involves a person of some other religion, they say, oh, the Hindus were very bad toward that person. You know, all, you know, something should be done. But if somebody of other religion does something to the Hindus, uh, they, they either ignore it or they think they act as if it wasn't such a bad thing. Because I hear all the time, I get news reports about Bihar, Bengal, where the Muslims are tearing down... Uh, businesses that belong to Hindus, houses that belong to Hindus, uh, burning them up, or in Pakistan where they're kidnapping the girls and turning them into Muslims or raping them and or forcing them into marriages, things like that. It's going on on a continual basis. How much do you really hear about that? You don't hear about it unless you're connected to the right uh, outlets or the right uh, 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 newsletters or things like that. Uh, because, and this is something, so the point of it is, don't worry about what you're being thought of because they don't think of you very nicely anyway. The point of it is, it's time to protect and preserve our culture. Just a minute here, when you say you, are you referring to any person who is following Vedic tradition? Are you referring to ISKCON or when you are oh, not, what are you referring to? You means any, yeah, you means anybody, anybody, you, you as a Indian, you as a Hindu. You should need, you, we should all work together to preserve, protect, promote, and perpetuate no, no, no. That, our culture. That, that, that part is perfectly fine. We all are doing our part. But when you say you are already seen as communal, you're already seen as saffronizing the country. So, you know, there are, there are different that organizations means, that are that perceived means different. anybody who can be viewed as a Hindu, whether yeah, you're devotees, would... non-devotees, or whatever. If you're yeah, viewed no, as a I Hindu, that... then you're yeah. already viewed in that light. No, you would no, you would say at that at least by those people who are anti-Hindu. They already see you like that. Yeah. You know, no, okay, let me put it this way. Say, for example, in the public eye, the RSS has a particular image. Even if you say the media is biased, whatever it is, you know, we cannot we all like you said, uh, there is there is a larger reality which we have to deal with. 
and say if we if, even if we grant that media is biased still within that biased media say the rss has a particular perception and say iscon has a particular perception particular image and the two are not the same so so when you say i don't think uh, iscon is being ever seen as you are communalizing or something like that so no for example when i have you I, talked to anybody about that well generally we are we get opportunities to go to various forums iscon is seen as fairly there is a concern that we may make you into brahmacharis but we are not seen as a hindu <laughs> hardline organization as such maybe not hindu hardline but once again if you're trying if people view you as uh, an organization trying to make more and more brahmacharis mm. you know how many letters i get from people that are scared that if my husband joins iskon i as a wife will be left alone who's going to raise our kids he's going to take sanyas i mean they many people just take these images and just go to the extreme with it i mean way out of the ordinary but many people they they are worried that if people join iskon the next thing they're going to do they're going to move into the temple and they're going to leave their family and uh not only the parents are worried about their children but the wives are also worried about their husbands so this uh, it depends on who you're talking to about what view people have of iskon i can tell you that right now and uh and sometimes obviously it's misconstrued you know our purpose is misconstrued it's not clear uh mm -hmm. so they may have different views of the rss but they also <laughs> don't know that maybe the rss is also distributing hundreds and hundreds of plates of food to yeah. people during this uh pandemic lockdown that they may not know that iskon is doing the same thing which yeah. creates a very good positive image but at the same time some people feel that well it's for uh, uh it's not just out of the kindness of their heart but they're trying to gain favor so that people will join iskon you know people okay. don't realize you can join iskon and still live at your home and continue working keeping your job things like that uh, it's not a big so deal but people get scared about it yeah so what you are saying is that our focus should be primarily on as you said i like this four p's protect preserve promote and perpetuate with the culture and not so much on our public image you know <laughs> well that itself will give you the proper public image yeah i'll give That's you an example see i'll give you an example that uh, some <coughs> there are um, i was once invited for a program with uh, on the topic of ram fact or fiction mm -hmm. and i was asked to speak on that and it was a general hindu gathering and i was told that subramanyam swami was going to be there and i was going to speak with him and i was happy to have that forum and i know that he's a he has a lot of influence but later on what i came to know was the whole program was for building the ram temple in ayodhya and in that context they were asking whether ram is fact or fiction so i have also been writing books maybe for the last 15 years and maybe then from the last 7 8 years i have started entering into the mainstream mainstream publishing industry la my four or five of my last books have been published by mainstream publishers and they reach, they can reach a much broader audience right then what um, say if i only through amazon or through my speaking tours distribute so when i had this opportunity this was about maybe 6 six, six or 6 six or 7 years ago that was the time when i just entered into the publishing industry and my agent who was getting me to the publisher he told me that you know you right now have a squeaky clean image and if you are associated with uh, hindutva right wing then many publishing doors will close for you so then mm -hmm. i had to at that time make a strategic decision then i talked with the devotees and even within iskon there was some concern that see i am perfectly fine speaking on a topic of whether ram is ram is real or fictional and i have got a good amount of research done for that but when it is presented within a political context now uh, i don't i have no opposite i mean i would we would all love to have a ram temple in ayodhya but when the issue is 
is becomes politically volatile then when we commit to a particular cause we also close certain doors so some doors open and some doors close so i was advised by not only my publisher but also by several uh, iscon leaders that uh, you know better don't participate in that program so of course in retrospect i am not sure whether it would have had that much effect or not because it was just one program but my point is that uh, the public perception also matters in terms of what doors open and what doors close so now you have clearly in a sense carved out a niche for yourself that there is a large audience of people who are concerned about the broad vedic culture and you are reaching out to them in a significant way <clears throat> so how is the in the the strategy that you adopted for reaching out how is uh, to the broad vedic culture how is it seen in the devotee community either by the movement's leaders or the individual <laughs> devotees how do you find their response well, it's almost like i have two lives i have one life as shri nandanandana the chairman of the board of the detroit temple uh you know and i've i've helped uh, establish the temple in farmington our outreach temple there in the farmington suburb of detroit and uh i told our sankirtan department which was headed up by uh dave madhav to start a preaching center in uh, ypsilanti and arbor yeah uh both of those are doing very well uh but then i have another identity uh, and it also often happens where if somebody asks uh well who are you oh i'm shri nandanandana but most people know me as Stephen Knapp. Oh, you're Stephen Knapp. So this whole other identity as Stephen Knapp is one that's more closely known by the Hindus. And I'm more well known as Stephen Knapp because the Hindus read my books. Hmm. So when it comes to those kind of doors, those kind of doors open for me. Where if I'm going to be sensitive about uh say uh, preaching and krishna consciousness or something then i'll just go as shri nandana you know yeah uh, but if i'm going to be more forceful in my preaching about hindu culture and stuff like that then i go as stephen nap so these two so, ideas have never been in conflict they they have both of them have their own space and they're operating that way is it like that yeah seems to i mean that was an intentional that was not an intentional plan of mine mm. but it just happened that way because when i came out with my first book the sutra teachings of the vedas i wrote it under the name of shri nandanandana but you know most westerners they can't even pronounce that that's uh, some indians can't even pronounce it so i thought no better i uh, republish it under my legal name of stephen nap mm. and so that's how the division got started so for you you're known as chitanya charan you know and whatever you do that's what you're known as but for me i am already have i'm in a unique position in that way i'm already have uh uh two different identities practically and uh so it depends on the function it depends on the venue uh how i present myself and in that way under steven nap i don't care what doors close because i know I know what doors will open because of the way I present this philosophy and to who I present it to. And I can tell you right now, I I it's been a fascinating ride because there's many things that have happened to me that never would have happened without that uh possibility. Just like in the Northeast, I did two tours of the Northeast region back in the winter of 2000 and the winter of 2001. And I became very uh appreciative of the position of the indigenous people in assam uh, sikkim nagaland arunachal pradesh manipur places like that and i became a very very strong preacher when i was up there doing that and i was really hoping that more and more devotees would understand what's going on up there how vedic culture and how the indigenous tribes are under threat and fortunately bhakti purushottam swami has taken it upon himself to work up in the northeast regions which gives me great pleasure to see that and if i if i was younger of course this whole pandemic thing is slowing things down 
Mm. But if I was younger, I, w I would love to go up there and spend some time with him working in his projects, working in his temples that he's establishing uh, to help preserve and protect the Vedic tradition and the indigenous tribes up there in that region because they're very sweet people up there. They're very nice and they're very innocent in a way. Yes, two days ago I had a podcast with Bhakti Pushottam Maharaj also and he's, mm -hmm. uh, he's actually pioneering that and he has been able to do a lot of work. Yeah. So, that's true. So now this, 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 I mean, we can be explicit over here. You had mentioned that point earlier. So, <laughs> so now coming to this point, Prabhu, that uh, I don't want, I don't want to offend too many people. Let's put it that yeah. way. You know? <laughs> no, so, so uh, just leading from the earlier point, which you mentioned that uh, th there is a bigger war going on and uh, we often are caught in say winning our small battles without understanding what is happening in that bigger war. So, you know, I grew up in a Christian convent school. I was educated in the Christian convent school and such schools are actually quite respected. And my parents, I was born in a Brahmin family. So, but they felt that we would get good education I would get good education. And at least in my school, there was no explicit Christian proselytization. There was prayers which were in English and they were to generically to God. So I grew up with a, you could say uh, appreciation for Christianity, not as part, not a, not that I wanted to ever join that, but I grew up with appreciation for that. But over the years, uh, especially say when I read your books and then I read some other books, I saw the magnitude of uh, Christian conversion that is happening. And that is also, so broadly, if you want to consider the bigger war, I think there are three, four different things that are happening. One is just the westernization in the sense of materialism spreading. Second is there is the, so the so materialism is just gross sensual temptations that are there coming up so much that people go away from religion and dharma at large. Second is the leftist intellectual propaganda, which, which sometimes is quite sophisticated and which intellectually which intellectually denigrates and destroys people's uh, people's inclination to even explore what to speak of practice and that is coming in to some extent even through the educational channels then third is the challenge from other religions and within this i would say that christianity and islam there is a difference so christianity often comes in through the strategy of humanitarian aid, you know, whether it is schools, whether it is food for the poor people and you know, credit needs to be given where credit is due. I have traveled to some villages and I met some Christian priests. In some ways they are very dedicated. They actually go to a village and live in a village. We'll come to that later, but that is one threat. And at the fourth is just like say, I would say, not all of Islam may be radical, but there is radicalization happening significantly in Islam. And I was told that say in, even in Mayapur, not in our temple premises, but there are areas in the broader Navadweep where devotees cannot publicly go into Harinam now because there are more of, and there are too many Muslims over there and we just can't enter that area. What to speak of do Harinam over there. So, these are the four broad threats that I see and we as a movement focus primarily on the first that there is so much materialism and sensuality and, but we, we neglect the other things. So what are your thoughts about these four? Is, what do you think about this analysis and then we could go further into each of these? Well, your analysis is very good. I'm glad you brought all those things up because uh, I, quite honestly, I don't hear that very much from devotees especially. I hear that from other Hindus, uh, Indian Hindus who are concerned about these points, uh, but many people in ISKCON don't seem to be aware of it or they're not concerned about it. Uh, and of course, let's face it, you know, we all wanna just so focus on Krishna and you know, I'm, I'm turning 70 years old, so I'm becoming less involved in these kind of uh, wars or battles, you might say. I'm, I just wanna, I wanna th focus on Krishna and make sure I don't have to come back here. But the, in the meantime, though, 
I've written my books. I've written Crimes Against India and the Need to Protect Its Ancient, ancient Vedic Tradition, which has a number of points about what you just said, the different battles that are going on for Vedic culture. Uh, but the last section was different uh, processes, different uh, uh, plans, action plans of what to do about it. And so these are all things that need to be considered. Uh, for example, when I was in the Northeast, uh, uh, some people were telling me the different aspects. Because let me put it this way first. It seems like Islam is radical in, more so in certain areas of India, not all over, not everywhere. That's true. And the conversion tactics that are being conducted by Christianity is in certain areas more than other areas. And for example, some schools are very good. Indi Indians often like to te put their kids into a Christian school because it's mm -hmm. English-based. They learn the English language. It's very important. So they come out. They're very prolific in English that way, and, uh, and they can get, which helps them get a good career. Uh, in other areas, though, I've heard where some English uh, Christian schools, if you talk in your own native language, you'll get beaten up. Or uh, hospitals in uh, Dimapur, for example, in Nagaland, they were Christian operated and they would give hospital care to anybody, especially pregnant ladies. And this one lady went into a hospital. She was about ready to give birth. And they said, yes, yes, we'll give you prenatal care. We'll give you care with the birth, everything. You just sign these papers. And what the papers said, basically, is that I am now becoming converted Christian. And so when she read that, she said, no, I don't want to sign these papers. Uh, the hospital said, well, if you don't going to sign these papers, you have to go out. You have to go someplace else, which she had to do. So there's different, and, and I can talk a lot mo more about, you know, the techniques that are yeah, used. I read about this in your book, Crimes Against India. So how is this legally possible, Prue? It's a, it's a, I think it's a, even a taxi driver or a rickshaw driver, if the rickshaw driver discriminates based on religion, there could be a, there could be consequences of that. There is no religious yeah. discrimination that we allowed. So is it that these, how could these hospitals get away with something like this? Well, quite simple. Who's going to do anything about it? That's the point. If they think they can do, if they can think they can get away with it, they're going to, until something comes about it. And uh, you know, the the objection has to be legal and it has to be forceful. Well, for that, you got to have a team. You got to have a group of people that are willing to do this. And if there's no such group or team, then uh, they'll get away with whatever they can. Uh, they they get away with many more things than that, because when you're in a like Nagaland is ninety percent Christian. So when you're in a uh, an area like that, who's going to object to what tactic uh, is used by whether it's a hospital, school, or or anything else? Uh, so you're in a difficult situation. So the best idea is if you're in Nagaland to make it easy, become a Christian. If you're in Pakistan, best thing to do. He's probably become a Muslim, you know, so that's how it works. That's how uh, these, whether it's institutions, hospitals or whatever, that's how they get away with things. Mm -hmm. Yes, cool. It's just like, okay, in Mayapur, there are certain areas uh, where you can't do Harinam. How is that allowed? Who's going to do anything about it? So this is the thing that we're dealing with. The thing that bothers me most is that we have to understand that the more these groups or religions can get away with these things, the more this is going to spread to other areas of India. Mm. And we, this, so it needs to be prevented. It needs to be nipped in the bud, so to speak, so that it doesn't become a habit or a means by which that religion or uh, government or Marxist philosophy or whatever it is continues to spread unabated and until Hindus know how to stand up, until devotees know how to work with other organizations to stand up to this kind of thing, then people are going to try to get away with as much as they can. Uh, and that's what all I'm saying is uh, this is a not a one-man operation. It's maybe not even a one-organization operation. It's an uh, operation. It's a, a concerted effort which needs to bring together as many people as possible. And that means we can also extend a hand of welcome and cooperation 
with other organizations, with other uh, religious factions as well, as long as we're all on the same page of being part of the Vedic culture and work together. You know, we've seen that when they tried to uh, 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 close down the uh, temple in uh, uh, London. That, London, uh, yeah. When they tried to close that down, all the Hindus came together and gave support to the devotees. And that's what made the uh, whole thing change and turn around. That's so true. we can do that in other situations as well. There's no problem with that. In fact, it comes to our favor. It comes to our benefit in order to be able to do that. Yes, Prabhu. You know, there's one I'll tell you, that, that is one thing before I go on. That yeah. is one reason why the Muslims were su successful when they first started to invade India. Because that was back when India was simply a series of princely states. And they would, at first when they came into India, they were repelled, but they came back with bigger and bigger forces. So what happened was they would attack one princely state and they would attack it, rob it, you know, infiltrate it and whatever. But the other princely states would think, well, they're not attacking me, so I'm okay. What do I have to worry about? But that's exactly how they conquered parts of India is they attack one princely state, then go to the next, go to the next, where if everybody, if those princely states had gathered together, combined their forces, they could have easily have prevented the attack and the incursion of the uh, Islamic forces at the time. So we need to make sure we don't make the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. so, we all need to work together about this. Doesn't matter, like I said, it doesn't mean we water down our philosophy. Doesn't mean we stop our book distributing techniques, our Harinam techniques. Uh, doesn't mean we change the temples to make them more Hinduized or anything like that, if some devotees want to put it that way. But it means we can simply work together on the basic level of helping preserve, protect, promote, and perpetuate the Vedic tradition. Yes. You know, one reason I, I read in Tamal Krishna Maharaj's book on Prabhupada, it's an academic book, The Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti. So he, he addresses this question that Prabhupada's his critiques towards Vedic traditions or other expressions of Vedic tradition seem to be more strident than towards non-Vedic religions also. And he, he gives this very interesting explanation that it was sometimes Prabhupada's critiques were based not so much on how say uh, how wrong a particular tradition's beliefs or practices were but on how likely they were uh, those that traditions beliefs or practices how likely they were to take his disciples wrong that means how likely they were to take them away so for example gaudiya math is a very close to us they are almost like our cousins but prabhupad spoke sometimes quite strongly against Gaudiya Mutt also, or some of the leaders of Gaudiya Mutt specifically. So that was a very interesting point that Prabhupada's statements, wherever he has been strong, it's more for protecting the faith. It's not so protecting the faith or protecting the commitment of his committed followers. It may not be so much as an assessment of those, those particular teachers or those particular traditions. It's more that you don't go in that direction. But uh, what do you think about this? Because this was quite a sensible explanation. Because otherwise, also, I think, uh, okay, I have another point, but do you want to respond to this before? Well, I think what we're talking about is more for experienced devotees anyway. I mean, you have to be able to str be strong enough to stand on your own foundation. If yes. you're not strong enough to stand on your own foundation, then yeah, better just to stay in the temple, read Bhagavatam, read Bhagavad Gita, and become strong, become firm in your faith and firm in your conviction as to the tradition that you follow. Uh, it, and not everybody is able to do that, you know, yeah. but at the same time, if we're all respectful to each other, it doesn't mean, like I said, in the Charya Sabha, it doesn't mean that one Acharya is trying to convince the other Acharya that he's superior or my lineage goes back more years than yours does or anything like that. We have mutual respect for each other and we've worked together based on that mutual respect. However, if somebody's thinking that, oh, maybe I should join the Gaudiya Math, or maybe I should join the Ramanujacharya uh, uh, lineage, or something like that, because that's also a tradition which has a different view than we do, uh, then there could be a, a problem with that. 
But uh, for those of us that are strong in our conviction and stuff, we can work with other people. And I have many times. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still as strongly convicted uh, to this as uh, uh, anybody. Uh, you know, I just wrote my book, Bhakti Yoga, The Easy Path of Devotional Yoga, uh, just a couple years ago. And that is strictly the idea of what Bhakti Yoga can do for you, does do for you, and how it gives you the uh, epitome of spiritual realization. It's kind of like uh, I was just reading the Krishna Sandarbha by Jiva Goswami, and I was reading, and now I'm reading the Bhakti Sandarbha of Jiva Goswami. And he, he, it's interesting because he does the exact same thing that I've done, which is you establish a point, and then you make so many quotes from the Vedic literature, specifically Srimad Bhagavatam, to establish the authenticity of what your premise is or what your statement is. And, uh, you know, you do that, you study like that, and you become very convinced about what you're doing and the conviction of who Krishna is and the conviction of what Bhakti Yoga can do for you. Okay. So, <laughs> if I understand right, what you're saying is that uh, initially, if somebody is coming to, to the Krishna Consciousness Movement, they need to focus and ground themselves in their conviction, their practices. And then over the years, those who are already committed can, can see the bigger picture and then see what they feel inspired to do. That, okay, this is, this is a big battle. Uh, this is a bigger war and I want to play a part in this war. So, right. okay, that makes sense. It's, like it's like a new brahmachari. You know, a new brahmachari, what do you have to do? You have to protect them. And you generally have to protect them from uh, too much association with women. Otherwise, how is somebody going to be a brahmachari? Hmm. So the same thing goes. You know, you have to be, you have to give that uh, beginning devotee protection until they become strong in their convictions and understanding of what Krishna consciousness is, how it's different from others, and what it has to truly offer uh, the practitioner. And so that's just uh, a basic part of uh, the bhakti program, you might say. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to this point a little later, Prabhu. But uh, so strategically, aligning for, say, fighting the bigger battles, now I have seen an increasing awareness, even among the broader, uh, broader leaders in our, many leaders in our movement, of how challenging things can become in the future. So specifically, some devotees tend to feel, like I have been parts of, even in India, I have traveled a little bit, I've, I've seen various communities. So there are, there are some devotees who would like to do mass, out, you could say, not so much Krishna conscious outreach, but as dharmic outreach. And some of them start feeling that Krishna consciousness is too otherworldly. That we make too many demands mm -hmm. in terms of say, chanting 16 rounds, following four regs, and the number of people who are actually going to come up to this level is going to be relatively few. And therefore, apart from this outreach where we, we say make people committed ISKCON devotees, you know, we should do broad dharmic outreach where we just inspire people to maybe follow basic aspects, uh, to start following and respecting basic aspects of dharma, like say avoid meat eating, worship, respect cows, respect the Vedic, uh, Vedic the, de the idea of deity worship. And so more like generic raising of consciousness. And uh, there are some devotees who feel strongly that this is what we should be doing. And in some ways, if, if say devotees, even when I read your book, I say about crimes against India, and I saw what, what is being done, then sometimes we start feeling that by practicing Krishna consciousness, what am I really doing? Now, there are so many things which are going wrong and I'm spending so much time in my sadhana and this and that. So what, what was a concern for many devotee leaders is that if there's a choice between say, protecting the broad dharmic culture 
and hearing about threats to that, that in a sense agitates the mind a lot and that can incite people to action much faster than even devotees. They can be incited to action much faster than to, you know, maybe, maybe become a pure devotee or learn to give up the sense gratification or things like that. So what, what can happen, or that is, a, that is a fear in a community that I was quite often a part of, that if people, if this starts propagating much more, then many more people who could be devotees will get caught in these things. And their focus on their sadhana, their focus on their, uh, their personal spiritual growth, that will shift to more of a generic dharmic outreach. Which is not a bad thing from a broader perspective, but still from a, the movement's perspective, from the institution's perspective, that seemed to be like a erosion of its resources. So there are two distinct... Anyway, uh, would you like to respond to this concerns, such concerns? Well, basically, if you're not purified, how can you purify others? If you're not purified, how effective are your actions ever going to be? Don't think that you can wake someone else up if you're still half asleep. You know, you have to become completely awake. You have to become purified. And that's what Bhaiti Bhakti is all about. If you're not willing to follow it, don't expect to have so much result from your own actions. And if you want to also purify the planet, you have to become purified. By your association, others can become purified as well. But in this day and age, we're having, you might say we're having a time where we have specialized preachers. Different preachers can preach in different ways. Certain preachers uh, 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 maybe run a bhakti program. Other preachers may write books. Maybe other preachers uh, go out and do book distribution door to door. Other preachers may lead uh, Harinam uh, parties, uh, Sankirtan parties like that. So we have different preachers who are capable, more capable of doing different things. It's not everybody has to do the same thing. And there's only certain people that probably take an interest in the type of preaching outreach program that we, you and me, uh, are talking about. So don't expect everybody to be qualified for this or even take an interest in it. Uh, I think people should be aware of it, but then there should be a program with the appropriate people who can handle this kind of activity, this kind of outreach, this kind of uh, working with other institutions. Not everybody's gonna be able to do that. So you have to be mature enough to recognize the quality of the individuals in the service that they're capable of doing and take it from there. And that way, those people that are not inclined towards this or that are plugged into the right activity where they can continue to engage in their devotional service to become increasingly purified. It's like some, some people are, are, they look like uh, motivational speakers. They may have the means to attract people through that kind of preaching. But that doesn't mean we remain motivational speakers. We have to also reach a stage where we can give people the direct means of becoming fully Krishna conscious. We can't deny that. And this is one of the things that the temples are for. So people can engage in activities which purify them and lead the way to becoming fully Krishna conscious. That's why it's always said, you know, you, 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 you're a Vaidhi Bhakti for now, then you graduate to become a Baba Bhakti, hmm. then later you graduate to become a Prema Bhakti. You know, there's got to be this ladder of step-by-step -step progress by which we're not stuck in simply outreach preaching or motivational speaking or this kind of thing. We have to understand what the full map of Bhakti Yoga is so that we understand what is ultimately expected of us. And uh, naturally, there's going to be those people who are new to Krishna consciousness who may not be able to follow the four regulated principles. That doesn't mean we change it and say, well, if you can follow uh, no illicit sex, then that's good. You know, No. One of the processes is no illicit sex. This is one of the processes that you have to establish. So, you know, depending on how you're able to understand and participate, will also depend on where you stand in the whole process of bhakti yoga. I mean, I was just reading in the uh, Krishna Sandarbha, where uh, Vedivyas gave 
all the different Vedic literature to all his disciples who were able to then give it to their disciples and distribute it amongst humanity. But he waited until finally Narada Muni told him that he should write the Srimad Bhagavatam. But who did he give the Srimad Bhagavatam to? Shukadeva Goswami. And why did he give it to Shukadeva Goswami? Because he was the only one who did not have any material desires. In other words, he was the one that was only able to understand the full gamut of Srimad Bhagavatam because of his lack of material desires. In other words, if you're filled with material desires, you're not going to understand the Vedic culture, the Vedic literature that deeply. You have to reach a stage where you can realize that you're no longer motivated by, by material desires. I was reading Krishna, uh, Jiva Goswami's Preeti Sandarbha, and I've read the, Bhag you know, the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. I've read the Krishna book uh, several times. But when I read the Jiva Goswami's Preeti Sandarbha, he would take a verse from the 10th canto and explain that here's the devotee, here's his service. This service establishes this relationship with Krishna, and because of this relationship, he experienced or she experienced this ecstasy. And I'm thinking to myself, I read that verse. I had no idea there was so much depth to it. So the point of it is, the more purified we become, the deeper we can understand and the deeper we can relish the pastimes of Krishna and what Bhakti Ras has to offer. This also has to be included in everybody's understanding of what Bhakti Yoga is. We can't just uh, focus merely on the uh, battle uh, of taking on the challenges uh, that uh, Vedic culture is uh, forced to deal with. We have to realize that we may also, as ISKCON, we may also have to deal with these uh, challenges. But, but still, the point of the whole Bhakti Yoga is to become completely purified so that we can relieve ourselves of these material desires so that we can spiritualize and purify other people around us, and so that ultimately we can enter back into the spiritual world. This is the point we have to understand. This should not be uh, watered down. It should not be ignored, and it has to be discussed. So How then you go from Vaidhi Bhakti to Raga Nuga Bhakti, like that. Yes, sir. So what, what you're saying is that, I like the example of a specialized service. So, Sorry. So I like the example of specialized service. So every service has its challenges. Say if you want to build a temple, fundraising brings its own anxiety. And if somebody cannot take up that anxiety, and if say taking up that anxiety it agitates them so much that they stop doing their sadhana, then maybe that is not a service they should take up. So similarly, if, uh, if hearing about the broad challenges to dharma and, uh, and say all the crimes against India, what you talked about. If reading about all this starts agitating people's minds so much that they can't focus on their core bhakti practices, then maybe this is not exactly the service that they should get involved in. So exactly. Is, That's yeah, exactly so, right. Okay. So I think this idea that... It requires a certain strength to get involved in this kind of awareness. It also takes a certain kind of strength to raise the funds to build a temple. Yeah. You know, so everybody has their own strengths, their own abilities, uh, their own means of uh, helping with the culture. Uh, and so those is what needs to be uh, recognized. And so that person can be engaged in that way and thus do the most practical thing he can for the movement, uh, for ISKCON, and for uh, Vedic culture in India. Mm. Yes. Sir. So this has to be determined by someone who's mature enough. Uh, to recognize these things. And that was what actually Guru Kula was for. Guru Kula always meant that the teachers understand the proclivities, the intelligence, the talents, the abilities of the student to direct him in the right way. That was what Barn Ashram is really all about. And so that's the purpose. But also in the temples, we can establish Barn Ashram right now, right here. It doesn't have to be an agricultural project. It can be understanding what the proclivities, what the nature is, what the intelligence level of all devotees are so that we can engage them in the right service so that they can be properly service, uh, properly engaged so they become enthused, enlivened, and feel they're making a great contribution to society, to the society, to ISKCON, mm -hmm. and in this way always feel motivated to keep progressing and keep, uh, keep helping others 
and keep working up the ladder of the process of bhakti yoga. So, and the leaders have to be qualified in order to do this. Yeah. You know, so this is taking me to further point you mentioned that when, when there were Islamic invaders, it was the Indian states were quite isolated. So there are some, we could say there's some inner weaknesses. So when I mentioned those four, four challenges or four threats, probably we could add a fifth one that there are some vulnerabilities or weaknesses within us itself, which make us, uh, make us uh, weak. And one point which I have noticed, say in the last few years, I also studied uh, the, the kind of writings that say Christians do when they are preaching in the West and Christians do when they're preaching in India. So, mm. what, so there is a significant amount of difference. And one of the things that they target substantially in India is the caste system. And because of the, the caste system, say the lower caste are discriminated against. And then they start feeling that uh, maybe we will have a better place for ourselves in some other religion. Now, significantly, I think what you write in your book is that the, ca the caste system is more of a it's more of a regional consciousness than a religious consciousness. That means that even if a person gets converted to Christianity or Islam, still that caste hierarchy remains. And a person from a lower caste doesn't necessarily get all the privileges or rights, even if they convert to another religion. So it seems that that problem is not solved, but would you like to speak something about this challenge particularly? <clears throat> yeah, I dealt with that in uh, my book called Casteism. Is it the scourge of Hinduism or the perversion of a legitimate Vedic system? And uh, basically, uh, it all started with Shringi. Shringi, when he found out that Pariksit put a snake around his father, he abused his position and gave a curse that he never should have given. Yeah. And uh, that's when the abuse of caste, or I should say, egotistical Brahmins came into being. And that's basically what the casteism is. It's uh, egotistical Brahmins who think their position is superior, superior above everybody else, and that they should get more honor and, and uh, respect than everybody else. But that was never, uh, and, and then of course, then you had the English who uh, manipulated that and took advantage of that and uh, caused more divisions amongst uh, Indian society because of that. And still in some areas, the uh, uh, suburban or the uh, rural areas, that uh, caste system is still implemented to some degree, when that was never the case at all. The caste system, as far as I'm concerned, you could throw that in the dumpster and, and uh, burn it and send it away forever. So we need to be able to understand, <clears throat> show people what, <clears throat> the casteism is meant to be, which is the Barnashram system. Barnashram system is very flexible. And the Barnashram system is if a Brahmin born person is not qualified, he can operate as a Vaishya or even a Sudra, where if a Sudra is qualified, he can also rise up to be a Brahmin. Mm. Of course, we don't have those problems in ISKCON. So I always say, well, if somebody is uh, feeling that they're uh, persecuted for being low born or this or that, ah, forget that, man. Just join ISKCON. You know, we don't have any of that problem with us. And uh, everybody's treated fairly. Everybody's treated with the means by which they can all rise to higher and higher levels of spiritual understanding. And that is really what the Varnashram system is all about. Mm. Whatever earlier, your position is, you can rise to a higher, never, higher level of occupation, a higher level of spiritual understanding like that. Simple. So uh, it's a problem, though. It has been a problem. Yeah. You said something about a dumpster. Why well, didn't get that point? What did you say? Throw, take casteism and throw it out the window. Oh, okay. Take casteism, put it in the dumpster, close it up, never let it come back. Because it is a, a perversion of a legitimate Vedic system called Varnashram. They are not the same. And this is another thing that needs to be understood. Casteism and Barnashram are not the same. In Barnashram, no one is given an occupation based on hereditary. 
where casteism, that is what it means. Oh, your father was this, then you become this too. Because the problem is, is okay, if my father was a doctor and I don't want to be a doctor, that means I still have to be a doctor? Because if, I ha if I'm forced to be a doctor, I'm probably going to be a lousy doctor because my heart's not into it. So, okay, do something else then. You know, so this is the problem with the caste system. And uh, it's misused in some areas still today. So it has to be changed. And, uh, and it's not easy. Because anybody who has influence and power never wants to give it up. Simple as that. Yeah. And what you said But anyway, you can read more about that in my book. Casteism, is it the scourge of Hinduism or the perversion of a legitimate Vedic system? Yeah, yes, truly. So I think what you said lastly about, you know, in Krishna consciousness, we transcend this. That is something which is very practical because uh, the, although Krishna consciousness is very prominent in India, really... I have not, never seen any caste consciousness. If a, if a person is dedicated to practicing and sharing, they get the empowerment, they get the facilities, and they, they grow, grow in their personal spiritual growth as well as grow in their capacity to service. So even while being in India and while we could say actively preserving and preserving Vedic culture, it is possible to completely break free from the fetters of the caste system. And uh, the Krishna Conscious Movement is actually a living demonstration of that. Definitely. Well, let's face it. If there was any casteism involved, if Prabhupada, if Prabhupada had any inkling of casteism, do you think he would ever come to America? There's no way. So naturally, he uh, preached to the lowest of us uh, without the idea that, oh, these kids are just mletches to begin with. They're never going to grow up to be anything. You know, they're never going to understand spirituality. Uh, he took the orders of a spiritual master, and, and look what happened. So many people have become uh, very qualified devotees, uh, spiritual teachers. Uh, it's, it's totally amazing. Yes, that's true. So, Prabhu, I would like to conclude. I mean, we had a long discussion. I had told you one and a half hours. I've taken more than that much time of yours. But uh, <laughs> would you like to say if people want to connect more with you is your stephennap.com that's the main resource through which they can connect with you yeah my website is uh, www.stephen-nap.com or there's another one called stephennap.info stephen is s-t-e-p-h-e-n and nap is k-n-a-p-p -P. of course probably most of your viewers already know that and uh, I'm also on Facebook and things like that. Uh, but, uh, and that's all the connections. I don't have a WhatsApp number or anything like that. Like I tell people, there's only so many ways I want to be connected to the matrix. So okay. and this is it. The websites, Facebook, email, that, that's it. You know, so, uh, and I, I answer my emails uh, pretty regular. And, uh, but don't send me a message on Facebook because I only get to those maybe once a month because I, I just don't think about it. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> and I've, I've got more than almost 40 paperback books plus an additional uh, dozen ebooks, Kindle ebooks. And I've got a lot of free ebooks on my website. I've got almost 250 articles on my website. And then, of course, all my books have their own web page where you can look at it, view the contents, and uh, understand how to order it. And uh, all my books are also available on Kindle in India. And I also have a few books uh, that are published through uh, Jayco Publishing in Mumbai that are available in India as well, such as Secret Teachings of the Vedas, uh, Avatars, Gods, and Goddesses of Vedic Culture, and uh, the one book called Seeing Spiritual India, which is uh, in India called The Spiritual handbook or seeing spiritual India handbook or something like that. Uh, mm. And which is interesting because I just got uh, just several months ago, I just got pictures uh, from people who saw that book secret teachings of the Vedas in the bookstores at the air in the airports of India. Oh. So, uh, and, and that's just straightforward preaching. That's straightforward Krishna conscious preaching that still was able to get out 
into the uh, airports of India and uh, many of the other bookstores. So it uh, doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, the challenges or the, of India or Vedic culture, anything like we've been talking about. It's simply straightforward preaching. And um, so there's a place for it. You know, if you present the philosophy in the right way, you can have it uh, presentable in many, many different venues, uh, which was my whole goal, because I was never very good at going door to door salesman, calling people on the phone, mm. or, you know, I was just too introverted, too shy. So the whole plan was, okay, how do I get around that? You know, and this is the uh, system I came up with. And it's, so far, it's worked pretty good, and it's still going on strong. Yes, so it's remarkable that uh, you know, although you have worked as a single individual, not only have you written a lot of books, but actually you have created a whole legacy of influence. And I had mentioned to you that there is this book on uh, the, what was that? Uh, American Veda. Which is a oh, book yeah. of, so that is a book about various spiritual how Indian spirituality has uh, penetrated into the heartland of America. So in that book also you are mentioned as like a researcher who has had a significant influence through the net. So it's yeah, yeah. inspiring how you know you took this service and it's a big legacy that you have created by connecting many many people toward Dharma and toward Krishna. So well, I remember when uh, I remember I, I went to see Bhakti Tirtha Swami before he passed away, and he was saying, you know, I, I've I've had a whole team of people helping me produce books, and here's Sri Nandanandana, working by himself, who's published as many books as I have. <laughs> you know, he was, you know, being humble about it, but uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's definitely become a like a cottage industry to me to some degree, but I'm starting to slow down. Like I said, I'm turning 70 this year. I'm starting to slow down with my writing, my lecturing, my traveling. And basically, I just kind of like, of course, in this lockdown, there's not a whole lot you can do anyway, but I'm just starting to uh, stay in my cave, so to speak, my bhajan kutir, and just read and chant and uh, just really try to get more and more absorbed and just uh, understanding and meditating on the pastimes of Krishna. I love it. <laughs> but thank you very much for uh, this nice conversation, Chaitanya Charan. And uh, hopefully, if uh, we start traveling again, I'll see you back in, uh, when you come through Detroit again. Yes, true. Can I just summarize? Because we went over a lot of topics. I'll try yeah, to... we covered a lot of ground, actually. That's yeah. true. <laughs> so we started by talking about, say, your journey of how you took up this service, it just organically that opportunity came when you wanted to write. It's interesting that you wanted to write for a Western audience, but then you got a opportunity, especially through that book on Vedic culture's global existence, to a doors open to come to India. And then you found that there is, because you are a, you are a non-Indian, you are a West American, you could speak things which would, Indians couldn't speak, their greater authenticity was there because greater weight was there and um, you f uh, there is a niche where we could speak about, uh, I like the phrase, uh, develop your potential or reach your potential, which could mean different things, which could be getting free from bad habits, which would experience inner power, get a sense of meaning and purpose in life. It could also mean self-improvement in some ways, but so that is very generic language. So by using that kind of language, you're able to reach a larger number of people. And then that whole genre of service developed. And then we talked about uh, when, the, especially in India, there is this whole possible threats of temples being taken over. And that's, uh, that is a bigger, bigger war, which we shouldn't be blind to while we are fighting our specific battles of directly sharing Krishna consciousness. And then in that bigger war, so we as a movement focus primarily on say the materialism and westernization but there are other threats also there is the leftist intellectuals radical islamization christian conversion maybe internal dissension because of caste systems so now taking up these battles or choose, choosing to fight in these bigger wars it can be seen as a specialist service and those devotees who are grounded in their own sadhana in their own uh, siddhanta in their own 
practices and convictions they can take up this as a service without becoming becoming inordinately agitated by it and if we do this there is a lot of opportunity where we can we can not we can find common ground and we can spread dharma and get people favorable to come to krishna eventually and uh, while there are differences say between us and uh, other vedic traditions but for we don't have to we don't have to water down our specific philosophy but still we can work on common ground and then by working on common ground we can we can do things like say we protected the london iskon temple we can protect things which uh, we would not be able to do individually and then lastly you talked about how within uh, no our heart has to be connected with krishna you mentioned your study of the sandarbhas and how <clears throat> if how unless we are pure we actually won't be able to subst substantially purify others so we we and uh, we also discussed about how the caste system is a big problem in india but krishna consciousness is a direct solution to that problem because we just transcend caste consciousness and everybody can become happy and empowered as a devotee so are there any other major points that i left out prabhu oh you've got a good memory chitanya charan <laughs> that's a good summary oh we could always go on talking but maybe we can uh, do it again sometime yes bro <laughs> thank you very much for your time and your sharing your wisdom and experiences prabhu it's wonderful sure, glad you. to glad thank to be here glad to help out thank you jai jai shila prabhu jai shri krishna jai shri krishna